I flew out of the courtroom and I called him and I said, okay, I have no idea what you prayed, but your God listened. Mine has never listened to me. I need to know this God that you prayed to. In the following months that were filled with my incessant interrogation of poor Jim, an interrogation that had all the questions, how can you say the Bible is true? It's been translated so many times. Come on, give me a break. Or, how could he have been raised from the dead? That's ridiculous. How can you believe that stuff? There wasn't any question I didn't ask. And there wasn't any calm response that Jim, did, Jim didn't give me that I didn't just scoff at him and mark and mock him. Whatever he peacefully presented, I followed up with, that is ridiculous. How can you believe that crap? Then there came this one moment in time when Jim presented me with a challenge. His words were, a little scary, you know, Marilyn, you've been in control of your life for 37 years. Exactly what do you have to show for that? You lost your home, lost your marriage, lost your kids. All you have is your job. That's only because I happen to be the boss. <laughs> so he said, if, if you were to give control of your life to God, exactly what would you have to lose at this point? Well, I was pretty scared when he said that because he was starting to make sense. And so that night, December 22nd, 1987, still protesting all the way and believing that nothing in my life would ever change, Jim calmly, in his peacefully persistent fashion, challenged me to pray a prayer. And following his leading, I began, Dear Jesus, with a chip on my shoulder and my eyes wide open and my arms crossed. But when we got further into the, repair, the prayer, and I repeated after Jim, please forgive me for all of my sins, something supernatural happened. And I won't ever be able to explain that, but it was very real that a very massive weight lifted off of me. When I finished that prayer, again, just repeating what Jim was saying, I said it with the very heartfelt sincereness that I could dredge up. Please take control of my life and make me the person you want me to be. Said with tears in my eyes, with earnestness that I can't even begin to describe, I was saying it like a little girl crying out to her dad. And that was the beginning of my walk with God. And I can hardly believe where it has taken me for the, the 26 years since that time. See, Jim, he was a peacemaker, just like my friend Solomon. Jim was a peacemaker who was a man who was worthy to be called a son of God. He continued to be a person who recognized the need for people to be reconciled to God. Jim was a person who saw the world of pain and hurts through God's eyes. He could look through my drunken, smoking, foul-mouthed, obnoxious person and see that underneath was a heart that needed Jesus. Jim showed me how to respond to the fire-breathing breathing dragon that had sought to undo him at every turn. And I'm sure in those days, by, he would begin his day by saying, Molly, I can't work with that woman. And I'm sure Molly responded with, Jim, just go and be Jesus and I'll pray for you. Jim was a peacemaker. His kind responses to my insults and accusations led me to an encounter with a loving God that changed my life. So is there someone in your life that needs to know peace? Don't be afraid to be a peacemaker. Is there someone confronting you and accusing you of being holier than thou? Giving you a bad time about living right before God? Are they making your life pretty unbearable some days? Don't be afraid to be a peacemaker. Don't be afraid of their harsh responses. Don't be afraid of, of their insulting accusations towards you. The world needs more peacemakers like Jim and like you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. 
for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. What an encouragement to us today. Uh, we worship a God who creates peace. And uh, maybe for some of you, you're listening to Marilyn's story and there's a connecting point. And maybe you feel hope rising up. I want you to not push that away, but uh, to respond to that. Uh, that God is there to meet you wherever you are at. And uh, we're going to actually uh, play a song right now. We're going to put the words up on the overhead. And... Uh, this talks about God being a sovereign God. It's called Sovereign Over Us. And uh, it's a real encouragement. I want you to, uh, as you hear these words, to, to know that, that God is a God who cares deeply for you and for those who are suffering for righteousness and for his namesake. Some of the lyrics say this, and you'll see the parallel to the Sermon on the Mount. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. You meet us in our mourning with a love that casts out fear. You are working in our waiting, sanctifying us, when beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood, faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. So when you listen to this song, think about who God is and how much he cares for you and what lengths he was willing to go to you to make peace between you and him. And also we're called to pray for those uh, around the world and also in our country who are being persecuted, who are suffering. Maybe physical persecution, and maybe it's insults, and maybe just a good opportunity to pray for them while we listen to this song. <laughs> 